session that is titled, Can the EU become a hotshot valet for tech startups? Uh, my name is Marilyn Fieschi. I am the managing director of Science Business, uh, Science Business being a news company uh, based in Brussels that, is, uh, that specializes in research and innovation policies at the European level. Um, on behalf of Science Business, I'd like to thank the ESOF organizers for hosting this, uh, this session. It's the first of three Science Business sessions throughout, uh, throughout the uh, ESOF conference. It's a shame that we can't be there in, in person, but really happy to be part of, uh, of the conference. Um, around me today, I have um, a really nice panel to discuss what the, um, the startup ecosystem looks like today. And before I introduce them, uh, just a fact, Europe doesn't have fewer startups than other parts of the world, but still there is no Silicon Valley in Europe. And for some reason, Europe struggles to, uh, to see uh, European companies struggle to grow. And we don't see uh, as many uh, so-called unicorns uh, as in other parts of the world. And so the objective of this session is to understand where, where we are, uh, how can things change? And there, there are uh, novelties around uh, startups uh, or technology startups in particular uh, have a, 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 a critical role in, uh, in the economy and in the economic uh, recovery in the further to the to, to the uh, to the COVID crisis. So a lot of, of pressure on startups, but it's also a very fragile uh, ecosystem. So that's all uh, all of that that we will look into into details with uh, my five panelists that I have the pleasure to to introduce. So, uh, and you will quickly notice that we have uh, an unusual gender balance problem. Uh, not a problem, it's actually really nice. Uh, and Jonathan, you're in a very good company. Uh, so we have four women and one man. Uh, so starting with the men, uh, I, should, I should do that. Uh, so Jonathan uh, Ho Halloran, uh, Jono, uh, to, to make it short. <laughs> so you are uh, the Chief Scientist Officer of Quantum MDX. Uh, next to you, uh, Nina Coppola, uh, Director General of Business Finland, the uh, Finnish Innovation Agency. Uh, also with us, Shiva Dutzda, uh, you the head of the, of the division 
called Innovation uh, Finance Advisory at the European Investment Bank. Welcome, Shiva. Uh, also with us, Ali Zaguri, you are the co-founder and CEO of The Family, and you tell us what The Family is and you're, um, in a second, and you're based in Paris. Um, also, uh, and finally with us, uh, Laura Gonzalez Estefani, uh, you're the founder and CEO of The Venture City, uh, and you're also a member of uh, two uh, bodies at the European level, uh, the EIC Pilot Advisory Board and the Investment Committee of the EIC Fund. I mentioned that now because those two bodies are actually are going to, to be important in our debate. So thank you. Thank you uh, to the five of you for joining us uh, today. Um, I think the way we will run this, this discussion for the next 90 minutes is going to be in an interactive way. So um, uh, we collectively decided that we won't have any presentations, but that we will uh, throw ourselves in, uh, in an, an interactive discussion. And the first question I have uh, for all of you is, um, is actually, how would you describe the startup ecosystem nowadays? Jonathan, let's start with you. Uh, how is it to run a startup in Europe or in the, in the UK uh, nowadays? Um, well, um, thank you very much. Oh, and just to mention that I, I got a promotion at the beginning of the pandemic, and I'm now the CEO of uh, Cotonix. So, it, so for me, for me, it's wonderful. Um, so what is it like to run a, a, a startup in Europe? Um, well, pre-pandemic, it was, it was brutal. It was very difficult. Um, getting funding was, it was pretty much all we did, uh, which really meant that um, the development timelines stretched and stretched, and the more you stretch it, the less likely you are to get further funding. Um, so it was... It was particularly difficult. Now, we were benefited a lot from government and European funds, um, which were great, but were very burdensome in terms of the administration that we had to do to run them. Uh, and, and so, again, added uh, a, another headache on what already was a, a severe migraine. But post-pandemic, things have been wonderful. Um, and you probably won't be surprised that that's because we're in clinical diagnostics and the world has changed. And it's changed in a way... Um, that has put a spotlight on our industry, but it's also changed the way in which um, the funding from governments and uh, private funds is, is flowing. And the way in which um, the due diligence is run and the way in which we have to do the administration of those grants that we're getting now. And it, what it's, that, that has done is accelerated our development, accelerated our manufacturing and launch to market significantly. Um, um, and it's really been putting trust in the company and the executives of that company to run it with the money that has been provided, with the right appropriate quantum of money to deliver on the, the task at hand. And I think that's, that's the critical bit that's missing in Europe uh, when compared with Silicon Valley. In Silicon Valley, number one, it's highly concentrated, but they make big bets often and expect 99 of them to fail and one of them to succeed. And... Over here in Europe, we make small bets and expect them all to succeed. Um, so I will leave that bomb there and uh, pass over to everybody else. Okay, you're going right in the in the chase of it. Just one question from me: How big is the company? So we are 75 people at the moment, um, based in the northeast of England. We've got an office in Singapore as well, um, where our manufacturing is happening. Uh, but we are expecting to double in size over the next 12 months. Such is the the change in our business um, that we've uh, that we've had uh, thanks to the pandemic and thanks to the, the the large government support that we've had. What functions would be those that you would be uh, looking for? So we're expanding our commercial teams, obviously, um, our sales teams, uh, and our in-field um, technical engineers who, who will be able to run all the servicing of our devices throughout uh, throughout Europe. Very good. Okay, we, we come back uh, to some of the points that you raised, obviously, because there are some very important elements in it. But could, can, Nina, maybe can I move to you? How would you describe the startup scene today? Uh, Finland has a particularly active and uh, successful ecosystem. So how is it over there? Yeah, uh, did you want us to present uh, our organization somewhat here as well? 
Yeah, please. I mean, if you want to say a few words about what Business Finland does, that would be extremely useful. You, you really, uh, we have a, yes, indeed. And we have a very good mix of voices here uh, with uh, a startup voice with Jonathan uh, of infrastructures or the community voice with, uh, with Alice. Uh, Laura brings the investor voice, uh, voice and um, uh, and also the, the EU institution to, to some extent, and so does Shiva, who's the European in Investment Bank. You are the national, you bring the national perspective. Yeah, that's so what please. I thought, that perhaps good for the, for the participants to understand, perhaps understand also where I come from a little bit. So Business Finland, it's the Finnish government's... Uh, uh, arm for innovation funding, for trade promotion and attraction of travelers and investments to Finland. So we have a very broad scope of operation uh, and, and we follow, if you talk about startups, for example, we follow them really from, uh, you could almost say when the research idea is created until they go abroad, like we just ho heard about Jono's companies is having their platform in Singapore and so on. So we are, you could say we are accelerators of growth, but we operate then with government budget money uh, alone, no, no private money. And we also don't make any capital. Uh, it's, only, it's only grant and loans. But then if we go to the Finnish uh, startup scene, it, like you say, it's very active. Uh, it's been very active like for past two, three years, I don't remember if it's three, but at least the past two years, we've been the country, when you look at the percentage of GDP that has attracted the most venture uh, investment into startups. So not, not of course, in the, in the gross amount, but as percentage of, uh, of GDP. Uh, for us, it's 0.12%. I think UK is next, it's 010 So it, it really is... Uh, Boo, kind of booming and now I talk before COVID obviously I suppose we get into the COVID subject in a, in a moment uh, and uh, we obviously there have a role because as I said we are not capital investors but we are uh, have a lot of funding instruments to help the startups throughout their journey. Do you also provide services to startups beyond uh, I mean besides the money do you, are there any infrastructures that you provide? No, no, we don't have that. And in the evolution of the startup scene in Finland, have you seen any specific sectors growing? I mean, we are all know now, I suppose, that the digitalization is, is very strong and it's those kind of companies that are growing at the moment. Anyway, I would say those companies are the ones thriving the most in Finland. Gaming has been strong as well. Uh, being a a small country, you could say, a little bit on the fringe of Europe, as we work also on trade promotion, export promotion, we feel it very important that the startups start looking uh, outside of Finland in a very early stage. So that's a discussion that we are having with our customers quite early on that what are your export plans? How are you looking to grow your markets? And uh, well, you know, infra as such, but as we are doing export promotion, we have uh, 140 people outside of Finland looking at the opportunities outside of Finland and helping companies uh, get, uh, get access to the, or, or starting basically their exports. So there we are, of course, working together with the startups as well. Many of them are already born global. If they are digital, they don't need to cross the borders as such. Indeed. Okay. Well, let's uh, let's keep uh, going around the uh, the room, and uh, and then we uh, the same thing. We will come back to some of the points. Alice, can I come to you? You have um, a specific. Um, I mean, you you come from a very different background. So, uh, what is your uh, what, what is your uh, vision, uh, or how do you uh, see the startup scene in France, but also beyond? As I know that your community goes beyond uh, the, the French territory. Yeah. <clears throat> Thank you. Hello, everybody. Very happy to be here. So. Uh, I started in this field, uh, accompanying uh, uh, entrepreneurs in a very uh, naive way, uh, if I may. So back in 2009, I just observed what was happening in Silicon Valley. And I, I could see that uh, a new startup, a new generation of startup like uh, Airbnb or Dropbox were, was coming up. And I, I just looked at 
how and, and I try to understand and I, I remember um, discovering uh, this accelerations program, you know, Y Combinator, etc. And basically, I, I, I used to work at the time in a nonprofit organization called the Silicon Sentier back in Paris. And, and I came back to my, my boss and I said, we have to copy and pass this model and to do exactly the same. And we'll have a Dropbox and Airbnb French way. <laughs> so uh, she said, yeah, go for it. And, uh, and I, I really did that. So I said, OK, we need mentors, we need investors, we need talents. And we'll create this three months program with all these ingredients and boom, we'll have the magic happen. Obviously, it didn't happen. Why? Because you cannot copy and paste uh, the results, actually, of a long history and, and, and context uh, into uh, Europe. But I've learned a lot. And what I've learned is that, yes, for sure, we have the talent, but we're missing a big part. So uh, uh, you, you, you've already been uh, talking about it, uh, the, 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 the ability to bet and to take risk, uh, the lack of ambition, the, um, uh, the, the, the fear of failure, uh, the bureaucracy, the, the elitism, especially in France. So all of these barriers are uh, uh, administrative barrier, uh, uh, but also cultural barrier. And the thing is um, that for me today, I, I run the family. So we bring uh, education tools and capital to 100 startups per year. It's been seven years. I have uh, uh, two uh, uh, co-founders. And, and what I've learned is that today, it's not a problem for all startups to raise funds at the very early stage. It's becoming a problem uh, once you want to raise more than 20 million. And then only the US can answer. And the IPO candidates that we have, and we know uh, they are, are all uh, uh, funded by uh, uh, big uh, American funds. And that might be a, a problem in Europe, uh, for Europe. And, and, but at the very beginning, for me, the biggest barrier was a, a, a mindset barrier. So that's why I've, I've been really focusing on education. And the family is really focusing on education and bringing the know-how and the knowledge to the talents here and, uh, and the community, the support. Um, so I would say it's two levels. If you, if you talk about uh, the, the startup ecosystem in Europe, the first barrier to entrance for me is this mindset. Uh, and today, I mean, you, 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 we can overcome it. Uh, the, the progress in the last seven years has been uh, uh, big, very big, huge. Uh, and, and just at our little scale, uh, it's 8 million views. Uh, on all YouTube channel. And, and I can tell you it's boring videos uh, talking about uh, the new business models, okay? So just to tell you the interest and, and how much people want to learn about uh, building a, a tech startup. And so it starts with the knowledge. And if we really want to be uh, to, to, to grow and, and to scale up uh, seriously, then it's about having a big funds uh, ready to uh, uh, bet uh, a big amount uh, at the series C. Shiva, I see that you agree, right? The answer to, so, yeah, go on. What do, what, what, you agreed on several points, so in particular uh, on, the, on the mindset issue. Uh, what, is your, uh, what is your view on the, on the startup ecosystem? And then, Jonathan, I'll come to you because you also seem to agree. Yes, indeed. Um, no, absolutely. I, I would uh, perhaps maybe sort of now frame it a bit sort of where we are coming from it, looking at the ecosystem. So this is on the innovation finance advisory side. One of the core activities that we have is doing uh, these very extensive market studies, um, and we have over 30 of them. They're actually available on our website They're by themes um, such as key enabling technology, some of the deep tech companies, some of, uh, you know, so sort of looking at these sectors and the and really what the financing needs are. And, and so when we look, when the question is, what, what is our view on the um, startups? One recurring finding that comes over and over again is uh, when it comes to these deep tech companies, because I mean, the topic is tech, but there's the way we see it is from a financing perspective, you have the, 
maybe the more softer tech and a deeper tech, I guess. The deep tech, uh, the way we would certainly differentiate, um, you know, these companies very often in an early stage have very high financing needs uh, for their R&D development. Um, they, they carry quite a lot of technological risks. So you have basically this compounded effect that really makes them um, to be seen as rather high risk. And um, so what we have seen over and over again is um, on the one hand, the information asymmetries, meaning you have on the one hand, the investors not really understanding always the science behind it and how such technologies could actually make it to market and make money. And uh, on, the, um, on the company's perspective, they may know the science, but they are not able to really get the story out on how this amazing uh, innovation actually can can solve a real societal problem and and uh, and make money. So what we we've captured that in sort of you need to bring more science into finance and more finance into science and, and somehow bridge that information gap. Um, another key. Um, um, you know, finding is that the eco the funding ecosystem or the financing ecosystem is very often perceived as uh, fragmented. I mean, so even though it's quite interesting to see that there is so much EU, I mean, so there's national money, there's EU money, there's, it seems like there's a lot of money around, but when you ask startups, they don't really always understand where to go for what exactly when. At a, in an efficient way, because also there's really sometimes it feels that they have to spend quite a lot of, yeah, time and energy to to you know to fill a lot of papers and so on. So this this sort of fragmentation and sometimes um, not really understanding how to get to that is also therefore making it difficult. So the EIC and I know you will come back to it. You know, out of our actually our assessment studies, a lot of the business case that led to the setup of the EIC came out of that. You know, how can you ensure that Europe does not lose these really promising deep tech companies that are coming out of a very strong sound uh, university systems, out of the entrepreneurial spirit, but then just when it gets, um, you know, interesting uh, for Europe uh, in terms of these companies uh, creating jobs and, and, and value for society, that they leave because somehow we cannot support them. And, um, and hence, I mean, I think this is therefore a very interesting panel to, to see how can the public support that, that we bring in really cap, you know, mobilize that, uh, that private capital. I mean, how can we bridge these information asymmetries? Very good. Well, that's that's going to be um, a core part of our discussion. Indeed, the the relation between public and private investment. Uh, before I come to you, Laura, just uh, Jonathan, did you want to react to what Alice said? Uh, do you do you agree on uh, on the, the the perception that Alice gave about uh, the the startup community? Yeah, I mean, yeah, I absolutely, I agree with that. And you know, when you when you start looking at at, at funding sources, it's very confusing. It, the, the whole the whole thing is confusing. When, you, when you're being told that you need to you, you need to go raise a bunch of money, and you have no idea what what that means really, and you, you're talking to the people who are talking a different language to you, and so you, you then you then meet a, a local representative um, in your area who then introduces you to public money, and then you sit down and you look at at all of the rules attached with public money, and you think, well. You know, that's not quite going to fit with what I want to be doing, but I need the money. So I'm just going to say I am. But then it was only going to fund for a part of it. And then you have to match that funding and you just think, well, how am I going to run my business? And it's just it's just too confusing. Well, I, we would have we would have launched five years ago had someone just written a check and said, go and do it. Uh, with, but you can't. Within government, you have checks and balances. And so you need to completely um, spend your entire time just filling out forms, giving updates. You have to employ someone to do the administration and, and constantly update, and it's, it's just too much. And we, we raised a lot of money um, from government grants. And if I could do it all again, I would raise nothing from them because of the administrative burden. I would rather give away equity and have it an easier life and get to market quicker. So. Again, that's 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 a very interesting point, which I think it's really important for us to really look at. Is that administrative burden puts people off, 
And I wonder how many repeat entrepreneurs go back to um, government funds to get grants. I can't imagine there'll be many. I know I won't. Okay, well, uh, I'll give the floor to Laura uh, first because she hasn't spoken yet. And Nina, I'll come to you. Laura, you've got, you've yourself founded the company and uh, now you've got this dual function of being in the private investment area, but you're also uh, helping to set up the EIC. So you've got all these different perspectives. Do you, how, well, how do you want to respond to Jonathan when he says no, no more public funding? Thank you. So, um... I'm a very weird animal, um, I have to say, because I have been working in tech as an operator for the past 25 years. I started my first company back in 1999, and I failed miserably in Europe because it was a dot-com bubble, and so I learned the hard way. So I've been a founder. I've been working for Facebook as an early employee. I've been working for eBay. I've been living in Silicon Valley for six years, and now I'm an investor working as well as an advisor of the European Commission in all these matters. So I'm a really weird animal. So the first thing is that we don't want to be Silicon Valley, and I want everybody to, to understand why we don't want to be Silicon Valley. Silicon Valley is broken in many ways, right? For those that have lived there as entrepreneurs, we know that yes, there is a lot of money flowing in Silicon Valley from capital, but there is a lot of competition too. And in order to succeed in Silicon Valley, you have to be made of something very special, which is individuality, which is not what we are in Europe. In Europe, we are social, by design. At the same time, we are the factory of talent of the world. Most of the people in Silicon Valley, over 70% are immigrants. They don't create, they don't generate the talent that they need. So let's not look at a, a Silicon Valley as a lighthouse, because I think that we are building something even more special. Just hearing what Alice was saying, I think is also, um, a validation that we can build something very special here with our own DNA. What did uh, bring such success in Silicon Valley was the fact that entrepreneurs that succeeded 65 years ago ended up investing in the next generation of entrepreneurs. That is the key of Silicon Valley. So until we don't get our own European entrepreneurs investing in the next generation, I don't know if you guys have seen what Stripe is doing, Irish company, they are investing in the next generation of companies already. Until we don't get that flowing in, it doesn't matter the public funding that you put into the table, we won't succeed. And with this, what I want to say is that there has been several metrics shared lately, I think it was The Guardian that said that uh, operate funds in the US, 70% of the fund members in the US are founders or operators. In Europe, is less than 3%. So going back to Europe, we have the most boring, dated uh, class of investors in the whole universe. In Europe, tremendously conservative, they don't understand technology, they've never operated a business before, we have the worst of the worst, and still, we have created amazing companies here that have been able to cross borders all over the world. I'm very proud of the unicorns that we have created in Europe. So, we are not that bad. I would say that we just need to change, A, the mindset, B, the investors' community, need to operate business and as much as we can balance the 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 number of professions as i call engineer engineers in the fund with ingenious engineers which are the financial engineers as much as we level that we would be successful and i, and I think this is why they've offered me to be in these two institutions in the board of the eic and in the investment committee precisely because of how weird as a professional I am. Now, but at Laura, the same time, yes. Laura, what does it change if that's the, the previous generation of entrepreneurs investing in the new uh, generation of startups? Why does it, uh, what does it change? Is it the amount of, uh, of investment that changes? Is it the, um, uh, the, the, the skills that they bring, the, the vision that is needed? Why, why, why does it make a difference? Well, well, there's a big piece, you know, 
Silicon Valley has been up and alive for 65 years, and in Europe, we have been investing for only 20. So if you look at that, we don't have yet that cycle. We, the, most of the companies that have been created in Europe in technology are, you know, less than 20 years old, many of them. So until those really get the wheel running, it's going to be tough. So, so I don't think that we've lost the battle at all. I think that now more than ever, and, you know, the pandemic has brought back a lot of the talent that it was European talent that was spread all over the place. You know, they brought it back to us. And I think that now, not only with this new fund that the European Innovation Council has created, which has several billion dollars, but also because honestly, startups don't have a complicated situation in Europe. It's scale ups. As Alice was saying, the hardest thing in Europe is to raise your Series B over 20 million euros. That's the hardest piece. It's no longer the small tickets from the very beginning. Right. So I think that now that Europe is really thinking about it from a different lenses and perspective. And I can tell you that both in the investment committee and in the board, we are scientists, entrepreneurs, venture capitalists, researchers and corporates working all together. It's super, super fun when it used to be just government officials. So there's a huge opportunity now coming. But again, we just created this a few months ago. So it's not that you're going to see the change from one day to the next. But I think that we have the bones now. We have the intention and the mindset. And we have the entrepreneurs. We have the entrepreneurs already and the talent. So it's just a matter of the ecosystem getting together. And honestly, let's not rely that much into the public money available. Even though we have it, we're lucky that we have it. US doesn't have it, Latin America doesn't have it, Africa doesn't have it, just Singapore, Israel, and Europe have very amazing programs to boost entrepreneurship. We need to push the other side of the, of the equation, the traditional bankers, the traditional venture capitalists, the traditional private equity, and the entrepreneurs need to say no when they are offered capital that doesn't come with the right smart ads, you know, because we can get it somewhere else. We are seeing right now that European founders are so interested in the comparison to the rest of the world that we can choose the So at the same time, there are so many pillars in the ecosystem that are being redefined. Some of them were already being redefined pre-COVID. Some of them are being redefined just now. So I'm very, very optimistic about what the future holds. I think that we have failed so much in the last few years. And as I am a firm believer that we learn a lot more from what we have failed than from what we've been successful on, let's see what the next 20 years of European talent and investments need to offer because I think we're going to just lead the world. Okay, Nina, you've been patient, but you wanted to come in about the public funding. Yeah, I don't know if we want to stick to that topic so much, but perhaps just a short comment that I see the public money having a very different role than private money. So they are not exchangeable. Being like a, a public money operator, if you want, I see that we share the risk uh, with the company and we intervene when the private money doesn't intervene, because otherwise the public money would be competing with the private money and that's not what should be done. So uh, in many senses, I would say uh, it's good if I'm not, I don't think companies should use public money if they can get private money, so to say. So it, we have a very special role. We don't ask for, for equity, but we want the companies to become, say, unicorns or big taxpayers so that the society gets, that's the impact we want to create. We want the companies to create jobs, to start exporting, to create revenues, to create profits so that we get the the, the 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 money back to the society so to say so so it comes from a very different place than the private money and that's why we should look at them also differently they are not competing or not even interchangeable that that would be my comment i run a private fund uh, that invests in the us in latin america and europe and I think that impact is very profitable. 
you know, every time I decide on the companies that I'm going to invest, I'm looking into the jobs that they're creating. I'm looking into the basic things that how that company is somehow giving back to the community. This is what I am referring by the old traditional conservative money maker a kind of like investors to the new wave of investors like me and so many other investors in Europe that we are thinking exactly like the public money, but privately. This is why we're working together so well now. This is why public money is going to be working with private money much better than ever, because I believe, I strongly believe that we can search for the same goals. So why not public money looking for equity? This is what we're doing now in the new EIC fund. Mm -hmm. We have grants, and at the same time, we want, we want equity. Why not? And why not co-investing with other amazing uh, funds out there that share the same DNA as the public money? You know, I think that these, this evolution that we've seen in other ecosystems is what we're seeing right now. And it's not anymore founders on one side, investors on the other side, public money on one side, private money on another side. I think that now everything is converging. And again, it's all about common sense, right? So if the founders at the end of the day choose the right capital, public or private, because of the amount of support and operational and help that they give them, that is where we need to go. So I don't see it as such differentiated as long as we meet the same goals. And I can tell you that in my fund, I meet the same goals at the public money. Okay, Shiva. And uh, just, um, I see that we have some questions coming through the chat. So uh, for a word for the audience, we will take questions from the uh, from you, so uh, don't hesitate to put uh, questions through the through the chat, and I will read them out to to the speakers. Shiva. Yes, thank you. No, I I just uh, so when uh, Laura was speaking, I, I I do really share her her optimism about Europe, and I would like to perhaps make sort of two um, bring two reflections to this. Um, what we have on top of everything that 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 she was saying i would also add there is this sustainability mindset i mean you know we do you know i believe that in europe we um this is our moment um you know with uh, with uh, i guess a us uh, political environment that does not really believe in climate change and a eu environment where we have the eu green deal we have the eib being the EI, the eu climate bank uh, with consumers, all of us actually having, and certainly our children having this, this sustainability mindset of wanting to, uh, you know, save the planet. This is the the where the the um, I would say the startup echo uh, the startups can really um, find their place in in a competitive environment to the extent that. Whatever, you know, if you think of climate change or sustainability, it requires a lot of technological also solutions. And um, so I would sort of put that out as how can uh, European startups um, take that as a competitive advantage in a global environment to tap into also a really a growing pool of capital that is coming from the ESG sort of uh, space into this, and how can therefore supply meet demand in terms of supply of capital meet the demand of capital. The second point I would say is what is also give, gives me um, you know reason for optimism is um, looking at our own financing instruments. So the EIC right now I feels a very interesting space you know in that in that in these valleys of the various valleys of death but if you look sort of then beyond uh you know the the, the follow-on financing uh, that 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 is being provided in europe through for instance our venture debts that the european investment bank has um you know comparing that to the what the u.s venture debt is it is more patient captain it is less dilutive more patient um you know uh, in the sense of longer tenors with uh with this you know trying to help companies in that scale-up phase to find their way the pathway to also debt financing you know so it's they're not just giving up the you know precious equity and um so in a way 
let's look at because we always say that the you know what what blocks us in Europe is indeed the fact it's overbanked, and I I would agree with that when you, when you you know so the traditional banker mindset, but if we can turn that to our advantage and find a, a financing ecosystem where st startups as they grow can tap into the bank market maybe faster and and benefit from less dilutive uh, capital. I think that is, you know, in, in their advantage as well. So they don't give up all that equity to the sharks of, you know, the venture capital world who may, uh, you know, so this is, these are the two areas I would like to put out, you know, how can we ensure that we build our own ecosystem? We don't need to replicate the US, we can learn from the US, but we have a lot going here that actually, you know, um, puts us in a, you know, we, we have a huge early, um, promising time to okay. take leadership. Well, there is uh, there, there are a couple of questions from the audience about this comparison between the Silicon Valley and Europe. And Laura, you said uh, very clearly we don't want the Silicon Valley in Europe. But then, what would we do uh, differently? That's one of the questions from from the audience. Uh, for the tech startup, if we don't want to replicate the Silicon Valley model, what how can we capitalize on what we have and uh, and still support better the, the tech startups? So we can replicate the Silicon Valley model because we have way more talent than in Silicon Valley. It's as simple as that. We are the talent school of the world. It's a fact. If you go to any Silicon Valley company, you're going to see that always in the top tier positions of the company, there's always Europeans, researchers, scientists, business owner, I mean, you see it all over the place. So this is why I'm saying there's so much more that we have. We need to keep it. We need to bring it back. And we need to create a very agile environment so that people like Jono don't need to spend hours and months going after the capital that in the EIB, in the EIC, in the EIF, in the EI, or whatever <laughs> is needed, you know? So this is what we need. So, so this is what we need to do in Europe. We have a terms. Oh, you see a term sheet from a Silicon Valley investor and you see the term sheets of Europe. Oh my goodness, you want to cry. They're the least founder friendly terms that you're going to see. We need to make it founder friendly. We need to trust. We need to take the risk. We need to understand that the biggest risk right now is not to take the risk, right? This is what we are seeing right now in Europe. So there's so many different things that we are going to be doing differently. There's so many different things that we already have. And there are so many different things that we will obviously take from Silicon Valley because they did really well. Community building, having everyone interconnected and stuff like that. But at the same time, we need to find our own flavor, right? The same as Israel. Israel did an amazing job there. Also, Singapore extent in Southeast Asia. So they, they don't want to replicate the Silicon Valley model. They just need to understand what is good and already working here and what do we need to bring and what do we need to learn from. So for example, I'm going to give you an example. Universities in the US show scientists, researchers, a bis a, a, anyone how to build a business. You learn the specificities of your uh, career in whatever, science or whatever. And at the same time, you have modules on how to build a business. And they have the MIT lab and they have the Stanford days and the Harvard, whatever. They all have that. In the public schools, Berkeley has that too. In Europe, our university system doesn't teach us how to build a business. We have the CERN, you know, the CERN with all that, which is the DARP, not similar to the DARPA in the US, but we don't know how to monetize, how to make a business out of that amazing research out there. That is something that we critically need to change to really uh, kind of like look up to other places that have been successful doing that. Can we do okay. it? Of course that we can. All right, Jonathan, you wanted to come in, and Alice as well. So, Jonathan, first. Sure, I mean, well, first of all, where were you, Laura, when we were raising money? That's exactly <laughs> the right attitude. I was I mean, in Silicon Valley learning. <laughs> yeah, I knew it. I knew. That's too bad. Uh, but, but what you were saying about 
it's it's more risky not to take take risk is just spot on. And I mean, let's face it, anybody who wants to get into investing needs to take risks and bet big. And, and you know, it's a spread bet at the end of the day. But it's the only way that we stimulate true sustainable innovation because without the appropriate funding with the least amount of administration to manage that funding therefore releasing the founders to deliver the business plan without without that it's a real slog it's really 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 difficult and and you know you then start getting into turning around your company um, in more than the three to five years that you normally would expect a return on your investment and so it becomes less attractive but you are as an investor who put all of that administrative burden on you you're part of the problem of why things are taking so long um but yeah trust in founders that's 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 really 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 good point um because you know what's the point of giving the money if you don't trust them alice <clears throat> yeah i just wanted to add to to the conversation uh, regarding the point of uh, treating uh, public money as if it was private money. And <clears throat> the thing is, I, I, I personally, in my experience, you know, uh, working with, uh, within a public uh, uh, infrastructure uh, and melting the public and the private, I've seen the, on the ground, the, the backlashes of it, you know, like uh, having uh, this weird mix of uh, always public institution trying to provide uh, help to for-profit uh, private companies, you see a, a, a misalignment. It's like a, they, they are not skin in the game because their agenda is different. The, the, they are not thinking the same because they are not provided by the same uh, uh, mission, I mean, uh, um, a kind of money. I don't know how to express this, but just to give you an example, um, before starting the family, I had this uh, public uh, kind of acceleration program and, and because we were financed by the greater region of, of Paris, when the, the boss of the greater region uh, was coming, we had to just for one week to prepare ourselves and to pitch him. But for what? Because he would never invest in the startup, he would never become an entrepreneur, a, a client, or he would never uh, connect with a network of, of, of investors. So really we were losing time and their agenda was communication agenda. Our agenda was survival agenda. Like how can they find a client? So it doesn't mean that I'm against uh, 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 at all uh, uh, the, 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 the intervention of uh, uh, public funding. I'm, I'm, I, I've seen something that has been accelerated by COVID. It's the fact that uh, now that we can work from literally anywhere, um, people will choose their place depending on the lifestyle they want, depending on the in environment of the quality of life. Is there an infrastructure? Are the hospitals good? Are the schools good? And, 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 and I think investing in the public infrastructure is can be today a very smart move for actually uh, 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 the startup ecosystem because now it's going to be more and more this game uh, i will choose the place where i start my startup depending on the lifestyle on the infrastructure on the quality of life that i can have in this environment so and of course Still, the money uh, and, 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 and um, facilitating the creation of funds that are able to bet big on, on startup, and this can be a, a big, a, a big thing for uh, for public money at this stage. But if we want to encourage uh, the, the uh, tech startup ecosystem, I think paradoxically, investing in the infrastructure uh, can be a, a direct good uh, um, intervention from the public money. Nina, do you agree? Uh, yeah, but yes. Actually, my comment was more to the Silicon Valley uh, statement uh, because I, I truly believe in Europe. I, I believe that we in Europe, uh, we have all the possibilities, like has been said already, to create a whatever valley we want to call it, a European valley. Uh, and uh, 
I think we really should look into it from a European unity perspective as well, because uh, in Finland, we are 5.5 million people. So we work together, we being public. And, and so we all, with the private f private investors, with, we all know each other more or less. They say Finland is a club, not a country. Uh, but but somehow, I mean, the Silicon Valley is also a club. If I under I've never been there, but that's how I understand it. So we need to create that kind of a club in or or the entity in Europe somehow. And we are not having an uh, the same Europe at this moment. I mean, we are hampered by different standards, different languages, and and so on. So we are not truly a, a unity. But I do believe that with the with the startup mentality, this unity can can be formed wherever is it then in in Ireland or various places have been mentioned, or in Holland or uh, even Finland. But wherever it's it's going to be formed, I, I believe that that's what we need to bet on. So. Uh, so that we get the startups to stay in European ownership as well, because the B round, as has been said, I, I also believe that that is really truly the problem for yeah. it's the scale up of the startups where the public money isn't there anymore, uh, if it's needed or not, but anyway, it's not there anymore and, and a lot of money is being needed. And I think uh, Shiva made an interesting comment about also looking at the loan at the banking system, because that traditionally, like, like she said in Europe, I hadn't thought about that before. Europe is very bank dependent on its financing system as compared to the US where there's a lot of more funds uh, going around. So can we, can we take that as a strength, of course, we need more of the, the big funds as well to invest, but is there something there? I, I, that, that stuck in my mind and I think that's perhaps something to explore. Okay, so let's come to the question of, um, of Europe. Oh, Laura, you wanted to come in. No, 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 don't go worry. Ahead. A, no, 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 I, was just, I was just going to give, give a few examples of things that are happening already. Go so ahead. I, I do have, um, I do have an accelerator program as well, Alice, and we invest 100K in little startups uh, in, in Europe. And the way that I am working with the local governments and with the uh, European Commission is that every time we invest in a company, private money, we believe in the founder, fair terms, you know, support coming with it. We just say to the different local governments, hey, we've done the due diligence, we know the founder, we trust them, this is how we see it, do you want to tag along? Mm -hmm. So I think that that way of working together with both sides do what they know how to do best is a, is a potential um, way of, of working moving forward. And in the EIC fund is precisely what we're looking for, right? Okay, we as the EIC fund, we're going to be supporting these entrepreneurs. What other uh, funds out there in the community want to support this founder alongside with us, right? So, um, but I completely hear you and I have felt that myself raising capital myself. It is, it is very complicated sometimes uh, to work with the public institutions, uh, but we will get there. <laughs> okay, yeah, I see. Uh, Shiva, I'll come to you in a second, but just to put a word of context. Uh, so, what um, so EIC stands for European Innovation Council. Uh, the, I think it's fair to say that the, cre the recent creation of a European fund in the form of the European Innovation Council fund uh, that invests in equity, in the form of equity into companies, is probably one of the biggest novelties. Uh, of this commission. Uh, it was the, the EIC was created by the former commissioner of research, Carlos Moedas, but the launch of the fund is, uh, is right now. And with the, um, uh, the, the launch of this EIC fund, I think the EU is really setting a milestones in the role uh, that it wants to take in, uh, in the, the scaling up of startups. So whether it's de-risking or taking the risk, or uh, there are, uh, we can speak about that, but, so just to have um, the views from all of you, and you can, if you hadn't heard about the CIC fund, please say so as well. Okay, that's uh, that's absolutely fine. But what is this, in your view, is this European, in this new European instrument, a game changer? Shiva. Yeah, I mean, perhaps I sort of, uh, you know, building on on this point of Europe and, and, and game changer. I would like to debunk one of these um, 
myths I think that are out and a lot of it I also rely on on evidence that has come from uh, very reputable economists like Mariana Mazzucato in her book like the entrepreneurial state where you know very often we we sort of have this belief that Europe is all about public support and the US it's all about this great private capital when it comes to innovation and she debunks it with uh, really hardcore evidence showing that you know, if you look actually at uh, at what makes um, Silicon Valley so successful is that they have taken a lot of the um, innovation that actually has been fully publicly funded through DARPA and defense budgets. You know, if you look at your iPhone, you know, most of these applications, you know, came where it's Siri or whatever through some other ways. And I guess what some of these really innovative companies managed to do is kind of bring it all together. So I think we need to be very careful that we don't fall into this trap thinking, you know, the US is all about this great public, uh, private capital and Europe is stuck with its public thing and it's all very burdensome and administrative because yes, it may, you know, uh, but I have to say having lived for many years in the US, the US can be a highly bureaucratic country as well for those of us who have to deal with administrative issues. So let's be a bit more level headed about the fact that it is ultimately when it comes to innovation, a risk sharing of public and private. We need to get that that right, you know, and, and, and I think this is where the EIC in my view has a hugely, uh, has a huge potential to actually be that game changer, uh, precisely because it brings people like Laura and, and uh, sort of as she was saying, you know, instead of having the, um, the prior approach of sort of experts reviewing files and, you know, through these uh, mechanisms, bringing really market practitioners, a diverse group of, of uh, yeah, public private uh, sector players into the selection process. It brings a, so I hope, I mean, what really, uh, you know, it, blending the public and private mindsets, because both actually have a real important role to play. And I think the COVID crisis, and I know we will come to it, has shown really how important the role of the public sector is ultimately for all of us. And we cannot just sort of say, you know, let's park it, let's kind of get away with it. Let's actually find ways to you know, uh, to make it work. So also from a financing perspective, let's blend it. Let's find ways to blend these things better. Uh, you know, have co-investment things, have how can the public sector support really get then much more private capital into things and make it as, you know, to Jonathan's point, really more user-friendly and, and hopefully digitalization. And let's use all the technology we have to, to make things easier on all of us. Well, Shiba, is the EIC more user friendly? The EIB is executing, uh, the, is running the fund, right? So you should know. Is it more user friendly? I think it's too early, maybe, to tell. And I, I think you should ultimately ask the user. But let's put it this way I know that a lot of thought has gone into the design of the EIC from the European Commission side. I know that the EIB, as a facilitator in, 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 in processing things, is also really ask to help to keep that user friendliness probably too early to tell um you know but absolutely should be a benchmark um you know as as deals get through the process uh, to ask the users did you find it user friendly i mean it really would be a shame if we fall into the wrong you know habit old habits <laughs> Okay, Laura, you were in the uh, among the brains uh, behind the EIC, so you need to say something. But then, Nina, I want to hear from you. How does uh, what role do you see uh, for the EIC coming on top of the uh, of what you already have as instrument in Finland? So yeah. I think that I think there's always a a, a, um, a misalignment at first in new projects between intention and perception. The intention of the EIC right now and of all the members of the EIC and all the different teams behind it is what I said. Truly, the biggest risk right now is not to take the risk. Let's trust the founders and let's lead the way. This is the intention. The EIC fund has been created in June 
and the EIC uh, bylaw thing, I've been on it, I've been part of it uh, for the last year. But I can tell you, because I've, and I wish those were somehow public so that everybody could enjoy them. The mix of perspectives from investors, private investors, public uh, government officials, scientists, researchers, founders, and corporates together take, taking decisions is very unique. It doesn't happen anywhere else in the world, and it didn't happen in Europe before. So by definition, if you do things in a different way, you should be getting different outcomes. If with all these ingredients, we get the same outcomes, I mean, oh, you know, it would be a matter of, but I really, really believe that we're going to get different outcomes, but it's going to take us Again, we are not as agile as we really know we need to be, but trust me when I say that so many people are pressuring the whole model and process so that we can get back to the founders community as fast as they need. Okay, and my question was a bit unfair because of course it's so all recent that the impact of the EIC is not too early to, to evaluate, but Nina, what are your hopes when it comes yeah. to the EIC? Well, I think as Laura said, I think this is now a new initiative. So everybody has high hopes and I really believe it can be and can bring something new. It can bring this uh, unity to a pan-European uh, approach. So bringing us further to the European Valley, if we want, bringing, bringing players together, operating in a new way, in a European way and not copying anything. Uh, that I think is the is the big benefit. The other big benefit is as as you asked that how is it on 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 top or or together with the national? Uh, it's a truly an add-on because national, especially our nation, cannot play with as big money as the EIC can pay, and and anyway we are not able to do equity investments because there's different state aid rules for countries and European. Uh, com community can play with other other I mean they, they are not bound by the same rules so they're truly another approach can be taken and I, I see them as add-ons or complementary truly and and I I have high hopes that it will bring us closer to our I don't want to use the word Silicon Valley but what should we call it our European Valley whatever <laughs> Okay, and the difference mainly comes from the, the amount of uh, the of amount, money that... but also how it's structured. Uh, I would say that uh, and and what's in play there. I mean, like I said, it it is about investing in the company together with the founders. Something that we are not doing in our agency is not doing. Okay, Alice and Jonathan, have you heard of the CIC fund, or is it the first time you hear about it? Uh, to be honest, I've, I think I've seen a little bit of information, uh, but not enough uh, uh, to be fully aware of it. And um, I'm, I'm, I'm interested. I mean, uh, for me, it's really a matter of stage. Uh, I, I think money in early stage is overrated in a way like scarcity at the stage can help and, um, and, and, and just always put this in balance with, uh, I mean, public money is not unlimited money. Public money is people's money, right? There is a, a certain amount. And, and when I see just in France, the, the, the public schools and the university, like the lack of money. And when I compare, because I'm every day with young entrepreneurs, how fast they can spend 1 million. And I, I just think like, Okay, so this one million in a university or in a school could have somehow so much so much more impact than uh, 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 buying ads on Facebook or, or, or trying a new marketing thing. It's just that for me, accelerating what uh, uh, what a startup has already been proving as being right on the market, meaning Series B, C, D, uh, is really where uh, I would expect. Uh, the, the the this fund to go and and and, and why not why not uh, double down doubling down uh, when uh, an investor or, or an acceleration program uh, 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 bet on one startup little amounts but uh, uh, yeah that's, that's 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 my view on it Jonathan yeah so I must admit I have not heard of it before. Uh, before we started talking 
Uh, and but that doesn't mean anything. I may have heard about it, but I would have immediately discredited it because of my skeptical view of public funding. Um, had I, however, heard from uh, Laura and Shiva prior to it, I would have been much more interested. That I am, uh, the worm has turned for me, and I am very, very interested to learn a lot more. I have, I have a million questions. Um, for instance, um, yeah, how is the due diligence done? Do you lead? Do you follow? What's the administrative burden? How long does it, uh, are your investments for? Do you have a three year return on investment window of five or seven? How, what industries are you looking at? Is it, is it all of them? And if that's the case, how do you find the experts to then look into doing yes. the due diligence and all? Yes. I could go on, but I, I, we've only got 26 <laughs> so, minutes so, left. So the main, <laughs> just so answers to the main questions. Um, so, and, and I'm also going to, it's going to be a joint uh, answer also for Addis. Uh, so we see a lot of breakthrough technologies in, 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 for example, in medical stuff and in Europe, for example, and uh, those uh, companies, uh, you know, it's really hard for them to get their first tickets because normally there's a clinical trial that is required that takes a couple of years, blah, 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 right? So we give also small chunks of capital below two million uh, so that those uh, founders and scientists can build something from the very beginning until they get the right funding from other type of business companies or funds right afterwards. So we do invest small portions in the beginning, but we also do up to 17 million euros is that it could be a leading series B, right? So we lead. Yes. So it's not only that it's, it's, we are not going to say, OK, we give you this money, but you need to go out and find the lead for the round. No, we are taking our own decisions. So uh, if a round, a Series B or a Series D of 50 million, you can count on certain capital from the European Investment Fund. We know the, from the European EIC Fund. We know that we know the role we have in the ecosystem. Same meaning that we need to support those that have the riskiest ideas. Uh, we are going to be, it's a completely different way. Again, the people involved now, it's a mix of financial engineers and ingenious engineers, right? This is a mix now. And the due diligence changes too. They are experts and pieces, but we can also uh, put our expertise and stuff uh, into the flow. So it is, it is very, very different to what it used to be in the past. What about the bureaucracy? The bureaucracy is still terrible. I have to admit that. I would be lying to you. Uh, but the idea is that it shouldn't get more than three to four months, which on average is what it takes a traditional investor to go through the flow. That's what the goal and the KPI that we have. But today, with all the COVID thing and stuff, I have to admit that we have not been yet. Uh, we are not in, in below six months, but it will change. Promise that it will change. That's too far. I was just about to send you my investor deck, but then please hearing, do so. But then please hearing do so. that, and I will put it through the funnel. Do so. <laughs> yes, that's the way. That's the way to go. Definitely, okay. Yes. Well, consider it sent. Yes. <laughs> Maybe I was just, you know, I mean, after to build on what Lara was saying. Um, to Jonathan's question, indeed, I mean, so the due diligence, I mean, so here, I think the the EIC is really also, or the Commission, I should say, the European Commission is really trying to indeed find the, the uh, you know, kind of uh, create a setup where uh, for efficiency and, and so on, it builds on, on you know, on, on know-how that already exists in the system and the system therefore incorporates also the European Investment Bank. So there is a sort of two, two ways of like service agreements, so to speak. I mean, the principal investor is the commission through the EIC, but the EIB, has a role of facilitation, sort of advice, you know, kind of in the execution of that due diligence, just to for for the uh, to ensure that you know um, this this kind of uh, you you're not starting from scratch in terms of creating all of that capacity 
in the commission, you know, from scratch. So you you bring in uh, that expertise that already um, in the bank exists through our quasi equity uh, investments. You know, we have uh, two billions, uh, a portfolio of two billions of venture capital. Uh, so the accelerator program under the EIC has basically, uh, you know, equity and also quasi equity type instruments, and and it's therefore building on that execution capability. My team under the advisory is also kind of preparing the ground. So we really, I mean, I guess the, the my understanding certainly is that the commission is really trying to ensure that it lives up to this um, yeah, high ambition to make it user friendly, efficient by, and, and therefore we are also in a way on the hook as the EIB to facilitate that process to really you know, uh, ensure that, uh, so the user friendliness when it comes to my team is people are um, look, you know, once there's a selection process by these experts that Laura was referring to by the selection panels, things get passed on and it's for up to that, uh, those people to really make sure that they rather quickly uh, identify um, bottlenecks, issues that need to, to be resolved rather quickly so that that execution process during the due diligence is as you know, smooth as possible. Uh, but, you know, we're, there have only been, I guess, what, four rounds, or this is the fourth round soon. I mean, it, you know, it's, it's early days. There's a huge learning curve still, you know, in that system. Um, and I think it's really for companies like yours to test it and uh, to hopefully also find ways to feed back, you know, to, to all the actors involved to make it better, because that's the goal. Okay, I want to move to the next topic because we have only 20 minutes left, but uh, the making a transition um, in the um, prior to the COVID crisis, uh, we are not out of the crisis yet, but a number of instruments have been put in place and in fact the EIC is one of the big beneficiary in this research and innovation um, ecosystem uh, of the, the, uh, the next generation uh, fund, right, the economic um, economic uh, recovery fund that the Euro uh, that the European Union has put in place. So I want to speak about the impact of COVID. Um, to start, uh, well, Jonathan, just tell us your story. I mean, why has COVID changed the way well, your company has developed? Yes. Yeah, well, for, for, for 10 years, as, as we started this company, we were the ugly duckling of the world, desperately feeding off the scraps um, of funding out there and then the COVID hit and everybody realized that a, a really good quick diagnostic that you can take away away in your pocket and test yourself constantly would be a really good idea we have that and so we went from ugly duckling to beautiful swan overnight essentially and so it's really, already developed yes we had previously developed it and, it and we developed it mainly for work in third world countries with tuberculosis malaria HIV and that sort of thing but being, being a high quality platform that can do infectious disease testing very, very rapidly, we, were, we went from zero to hero very, very quickly and, and benefited from a very large grant from the government that happened almost overnight. I mean, it was the complete opposite of the usual public funds in the sense that there was no administration other than a one page outlining what we could do. And we received the money pretty much the next day. And and we've delivered on our promises from that, you know, trusting the, the founders and the team to deliver on what they said they would do. And we're now launching our product next month. Uh, and we're now in discussions to further scale our manufacture to create even more um, technology, um, uh, more tests, so that we can then roll out our technology across the country. And what we would really like to do is speak to the IEC about repeating that for Europe as well. Uh, and you know, we've got really good data to demonstrate that if you are doing the testing in the community, not shipping it to a central laboratory, you can get an instant re response. You can suppress the R number, which means that you can control the outbreak. Uh, and this is a significant uh, issue because it means the economic recovery can carry on after that first wave and we won't have to do national lockdowns again in the second wave. And the second wave is going to be two and a half times worse than the first wave. We, we have to really look and, and understand that this is just how pandemics work. It's gonna be really oppressive, but we now have the technology to suppress that R number and to ensure that we can re recover our economies just by making some big bets on diagnostics. And that, that, you know, that's great. 
So um, in terms of, uh, of impact of COVID, one of the, of the consequences, uh, it, it would, is it fair to say that one of the consequences is the way the governments uh, have been awarding money uh, yes. to startups? Without a doubt. I mean, it, the, the, the saying in government here now is that we've moved to a war footing. So in the, during the war, you, you make big bets on anything So because you want to run quickly. This is exactly the same thing. We're, we're fighting against a pandemic. And so there's a certain level, level of desperation that means that new, the usual checks and balances and administration is not important anymore. What's important is one out of the 10 bets that they've made works. Because if one works, then you solve the problem. Uh, and that's kind of the way in which the Silicon Valley works. Um, and they're not at war with anybody. They're just in competition with uh, Kleiner Perkins or with Culture Ventures. It's, it's, you know, they, you know, they want one up and that's their war. But so the driver there is, is competition whereas the driver right now is the war against the pandemic. And it's, and it's making people write these, these big bets and not worry so much about the consequences of, you know, a, a nine out of 10 failure or a 99 out of 100 failure. Because one that, you get one that works, then you're a hero. And everybody thinks that uh, Boris Johnson is, is, is the best thing since last spread because he saved our economy. Um, and okay, <laughs> but then what's the next step for you? Because eventually uh, the, the government grant is going to dry up, so. Yes, so, so we've already spent the big government grant on our manufacturing. So the next step is, is um, selling our tests, uh, a, a purchase order from the government, so this end-to-end -end funding, so do you put your money in the beginning, be prepared to, to put your, your, your money where your mouth is and buy the product at the end. So, so we're now working on our peer at the moment selling tests and then also now working on a much larger grant to scale. So we're at, at, we can make 2 million tests a year at the moment, we want to scale to 20 to 30 to 40. And so we're now going out, um, not just the UK government, but then other governments who are interested in this this, this um, concept of in-community testing um, to suppress the R number, to save the economy. And it seems everybody likes that. And we've got a lot of interest now. Um, so um, yeah, I'm definitely sending my business case to, to Lara. Okay, and that's great. So you can take, you can continue uh, this discussion offline. But to to all the others, um, do you do you actually think that this COVID crisis could turn into an opportunity for startups? Nina. Yeah, I think it is twofold. Obviously, I mean, it, it can be very negative for for companies needing to now raise funding and, and cannot meet with investors. I've, I've met startups like that because it was all cut up in March when, when we weren't traveling from Finland anymore and nobody was traveling there. But then uh, we have this program for new innovative enterprises, uh, like a funding program. And we see that the companies in this program, mostly tech companies uh, also on digitalization, they've been growing now uh, like a group, their revenues have been growing uh, during the pandemic time as well, because uh, of course the diagnostic is one thing that is now booming, but obviously also the there is a search for digital solutions, meeting solutions, uh, cybersecurity and, and whatnot. So obviously it depends on what, what the topic of your startup is, but it certainly can uh, turn into an opportunity uh, as long as you have the capital again, what we talked about earlier, uh, to to grow, because then uh, if you don't, then it can be challenging. Uh, then as well, of course, if you if you sell products where you need to travel abroad and, and show off your products, then that's a, that's again more challenging. But it is a twofold situation, and and I don't want to say that people capitalize on the the. I mean, the COVID, of course, is a is a. I mean, it's not a good thing happening, but but there are some some uh, uh, who who, I mean, even the what Jono is talking about, it's bringing a relief to the pandemic. So some of the solutions are like that, and some are are solutions that are now uh, dearly needed, like this Zoom uh, video conference that we are having here now. So of, I suppose most of us have been conferencing at home. There's companies in Finland that sell household machines to make carbonized water, which is now booming because people don't go to the restaurants or they don't want to go to the shops or they are sitting more at home and then they don't want to buy their Cokes, they are making themselves. I mean, there are plenty of examples where things are moving into a better direction. 
Alice, do you, uh, do you think you were speaking about this mindset uh, that has been a barrier uh, for, for, uh, st for the startup ecosystem in general? So do you think COVID could actually help uh, accelerating the change of mindset? The impact of COVID is huge. It's tremendous. And we, we still don't have the... the you know, the, 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 I've had the time to, to step back and to digest everything. Um, if I look at my startup portfolio, uh, I would say it's one third of the startup that have been totally thriving because they had tools that were exactly useful during this period of time. One third, it was a hard stop. It was so, so, but they survived. And worse, one third, they've had to totally reinvent themselves or they are just like, uh, uh, they cannot work anymore, okay? So it's really like that, the split, but because optimism is uh, the entrepreneurial material, uh, uh, I mean, this optimism has been really, uh, I have to say, uh, uh, used and tested and necessary during this period of time. And I think it's, uh, uh, not to talk about uh, all of the organizational uh, new uh, uh, ways uh, that uh, are ex being explored right now, but just in um, there is one interesting thing for me is um, for me it's the rise of emotional intelligence because right now you don't have framework. I mean the the the, the what what used to be uh, a kind of uh, yeah, frame, you know, you go to the office, you meet the other, you uh, exchange together, and a lot of things happen to these uh, invisible moments. Now you don't have these moments anymore, so you have to explicitly uh, uh, search for uh, uh, these uh, emotions from your employees and how do they feel, and not to replace this frame that no longer exists, but uh, to reinvent a, a way to take these uh, emotions into account. And this, this for me is super exciting. It's, it's super exciting for the entrepreneurs because don't forget that in the tech startup, tech startup world, most of them are engineers and most of them are rational and in the brains and not often listening to their emotions. So, these, these times are, are really super interesting. Um, and, 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 and I could talk also about the, the way we, we've had uh, with the family uh, to uh, reinvent ourselves because we were in Berlin, in Paris and in London uh, doing a lot of uh, physical events. And uh, from one day to another, we had to, to switch fully online. And I, I won't talk about all of this because it would be too long, I will share with you an article because I have made some discoveries, but just one thing is that I've, I've been discovering how you can actually uh, create a community and, and a, a feeling of belonging, even online. Uh, and during COVID, uh, just a, a team of two persons within the family has been um, helping 150 women to start their business through a, a dedicated activity that we have for women entrepreneurs. And, and the feeling of belonging of this community is huge. But it's things that we could have never discovered if we had kept the old way of doing things physically, etc. So I think it's, it's a, of course, it's a, I see it in a good way. Okay, Laura, I want to ask you something but with your hat of investor, okay? Private yes, investor. Sure. Yes. Uh, has it uh, has COVID changed uh, the way companies are pitching to you? Uh, well, I have to say that uh, we do have offices in San Francisco, San Paulo, Miami, and Madrid. So a lot of the founders that I've been uh, talking to in the past was already over video conferencing tools. So for me, I am used to this, you know, uh, world. Um, I don't think it has changed the way they're pitching. Uh, what I think that it has changed is uh, the time to execution, okay? So if before you would uh, get around 
a financing round in an average time of three months. I think that now it's taking a little bit longer because of the uncertainty. So um, you are kind of like, you want to develop the relationship with that founder. For me, it's super important to meet the founder and the leadership team. For me, it's like the, the first step of the whole game. And before I used to travel or they used to come or via video conference, we could do the first three things. And now everything is taking a little bit longer. Um, but I, but, but, but honestly, I think that there's more capital than ever available for technology because one of the things, and these are facts, I'm not inventing it myself. And I think this is because the whole world has realized that if it wasn't because of technology, our life would have been a nightmare during this process. And at the same time, the more uh, online that we all are, the more exposed. So, um, the rise of cybersecurity tools is amazing all over the place, uh, precisely because we believe that the next pandemic is going to be an online pandemic. Yeah. What would happen if internet went down all over the world, right? It would be like a mess. So, so I think that, you know, um, surprises in terms of fintech is going up, health tech is going up of all kinds, even veterinarian tech is going up, obviously. Education tech, we need to rebuild the whole education system. I have three kids under 12 years old, so I know what I'm saying. And, um, and uh, I think that the world is going to be better after this. It is already somehow, we have a huge economic challenge. But I think as what uh, Alice was saying, you know, we spend time with the ones we love, founders, friends, family in different ways, thanks to technology. Uh, and I think this is an amazing opportunity now more than ever. Okay, we, we are about to, uh, to enter the last five minutes of this session. So Shiva, can I come to you and, uh, and ask you, from uh, from the EIB perspective, so you've you've been I know uh, your services your division has been looking at different sectors in particular. So uh, well, the first question to you is uh, whether you uh, what are your takeaways from the impact of COVID so far? Although uh, it's also very early to say, but speaking of sectors in particular, where do you think the next uh, uh, unicorns or the, the next, uh, the, the companies that will grow faster next will come, uh, which sector? I mean, I, you know, I, I, I'm definitely not perhaps the, the right person to sort of give you, uh, you know, I, if I, if I were, I would probably be somewhere on the island where that is behind uh, Laura's <laughs> background <laughs> and not sitting in my little home office. Uh, Take a bet. No, but I, you know, but I give you a sense of where we see, nevertheless, um, a very powerful, I mean, I, I, we haven't really, you know, the word climate change and sustainability hasn't come up by the other um panelists so i i don't want to necessarily therefore you know maybe they don't see it as relevant but having said that we do see um that this covid crisis is a bit of a wake-up call to the bigger you know climate uh, change crisis and uh and hence, uh, you know, clearly uh, I, we see opportunities on the life science front and health, you know, uh, as, as, as one big area. And uh, the bank has really, um, really, I would say, um, managed to, to respond to the urgency. We have invested in a number of uh, vaccine candidates, COVID vaccine candidates. Actually, the digital, uh, we had to go digital. And in a way, it has actually expedited expedite a lot of the due diligence, having digital boards, I mean, online boards, online, you know, governance setups has actually fastened the process in some way. So, so healthcare, but the, the intersection of all of these, um, you know, the technology with some of, you know, looking at, for instance, at clean tech, you know, how uh, new, uh, you know, energy solutions, um, uh, you know, or circular economy. I mean, these are the big mega trends. Um, when I look at circular economy, where I see really the opportunities, how um, the, the digital, uh, you know, certainly AI blockchain, enable us to create solutions to actually go from mitigation to adaptation uh, solutions you know so 
I think there are huge opportunities. We are seeing some really interesting companies that are sitting in the US looking at Europe. We call them the climate or people call them the climate refugees. They're looking at Europe and they're saying, listen, I want to be, you know, moving to Europe because I feel that, you know, Europe takes this, you know, the whole European yeah, policy environment and so on is looking at this in a more, you know, holistic and serious way. So um, what I would say is to companies, wherever you're coming from, look at these mega problems, you know, whether it's a pandemic, the climate and so on, and see how your, uh, whatever you are working on could actually be part of the solution because that's where, you know, I would certainly hope that the EIB will put a lot more uh, of its financing into, but with, with uh, you know, together with all the other investors that are now, uh, you know, looking at ESG no longer as a nice to have, but as, a, as, as part of a must have because of also just the next generation of investors being those who really will look at sustainability as core. Okay, well, this is uh, that's going to be your final recommendation or your hope uh, for the future or your uh, your vision. Uh, I'll go very quickly around. We have two minutes left, so you have about twenty five seconds each. Uh, so the last four of you, just to say what, uh, what the one thing you want to say about how you uh, you would you see uh, your startup evolving, your community evolving, or the the startup uh, ecosystems evolving. So who wants to go first? 20 seconds. Jonathan. Okay, I'll, I'll say something here. So I think, I think from my perspective, it's very, very clear. We, we had 10 years of struggling to get money and administrative hell, and we've had six, seven months of just being given a big check. Uh, we've, we've hockey stick because of that. I mean, that just says everything. And we were in a really unfashionable business, but now it's very fashionable. If you give, entrepreneurs the money the appropriate funding and the freedom uh, they will deliver and that's how silicon valley does it accept okay. failures enjoy the, the successes very good nina what's the next step for the europe uh, you do for europe's valley yeah well the i i think we have to bet on the startups and on the tech startups i i agree on the sustainability aspect as well and i do believe that 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 is uh, something that will grow even further into the future. So it's not only for the startups, it's also for the established businesses, but it's certainly something that we need to take into account. And okay. uh, there, there, I think all of us has, ha have a role to play. Addis, you have 10 seconds. That timeline is shortening. All right. Uh, I want to see my startup helping each other to create precedent uh, so that they can uh, give uh, uh, leads away uh, for new entrepreneurs to start ambitious companies. Brilliant. Laura, you've got the final word. I think I want entrepreneurs and investors to think they're in the same boat and uh, because both of them think, act and do in the same way. This is the world of the end. So thank you very much to the five of you. And I'm yeah. sure there will be some further discussions uh, going out after going on after this uh, this panel. So thank you. I think we are uh, thank offline. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks thank for playing you. the thank game. Thank you, everybody. Bye-bye. It was a pleasure. If you want to exchange contact details. Yes, I will. Uh, I will. I think you can, but uh, I think if you uh, or oh, my colleague Andrea can also help if you don't have, uh, if you if you want those. All right. Yeah. And I just dropped you a, a, a note into LinkedIn, Laura. So. Okay, cool. Thank you. Okay. Very nice to meet you all. You too. Okay, nice to meet you. Thank you very much, guys. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Bye.